take your seats. And thank you very much. Remember, we are being live streamed, so anything we say or do here is being watched by hundreds of people. So we need to behave ourselves. So you're all, uh, good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Frank O'Mara. I'm from Ireland, as you can probably guess my accent. And um, for the purpose of today, I am president of the Animal Task Force. I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but in my job at home, I'm director of Chagas, the Agriculture and Food Research and Extension Organization. So today we are here for a joint symposium organized by the Animal Task Force and the Belgium Association of Meat Science and Technology on the role of meat in society. And this um, symposium today is a follow-on from the International Summit on the Societal Role of Meat, which was held in Dublin on the 19th and 20th of October. It was hosted by my organization, Chagas, but there was an international organizing committee that put that together. And basically what it was, that event, it was a very important scientific review of the latest developments and the body of evidence on meat's role in human evolution, in optimal diets at all life stages, in biodiversity and soil health, environmental impacts and greenhouse gas emissions, economic growth and livelihoods, and diverse cultures. And really what it was saying about, about those issues, and they are contested issues, controversial issues, the summit was what is the science saying about those issues. So today's event is a follow-on from that, and we're going to hear some of the, the papers, and you will hear more, more about that in, in a minute from my colleague Frederick. So just before I, I introduce our first speaker, as I said, this event has been co-hosted by the Belgium Association of Meat Science and Technology and the Animal Task Force. And for those of you that don't know what the Animal Task Force is, it's um, a European public-private partnership of research organizations and farmer and industry organizations, all working together for a sustainable and competitive European livestock production sector by fostering knowledge development through research and innovation across the whole animal production chain. So we're delighted to partner with the, the BAMST today in the organization of this seminar. And you'll hear from the president of, of BAMST, Frederick Leroy, in a moment, or in a few moments, um, in relation to their role in, in this symposium. But before we, we get to Frederick, I want to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Betty Besbes from the FAO. He's a senior animal production officer and head of the animal production and genetic resources uh, in the FAO. And Betty is going to talk about the global role of meat, a transnational perspective. And I hope you're online, Betty, and ready to, to, um, to present. Um, can you hear us, Betty? Okay. So just while we're waiting for, for Betty to, to come online, this is uh, a short presentation, if we, and for all the presentations, if we, if we have time at the end of them, if we're ahead of time, we will take questions, but we're anticipating most of the questions will be asked and answered during a discussion session at the end. We have a lot of people online, so for the people online, I would ask you to put your, your questions into the, the, the chat function, and we will try to get to those uh, as well during the, the discussion. So any sign of our first speaker? He was present earlier, so definitely we, we should have him. Now, good morning, Baddy. You can't hear us, okay. So our technicians are working hard on, on this issue. Hello. Yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Frank. Sorry, I didn't hear anything. Okay. Well, Betty, I said that you were one of the most important and best scientists in the world, that you were brilliant, <laughs> and that you were going to, um, that you were going to stun us now for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> So I'm sorry you missed all that. <laughs> That's a short synopsis. So, Baddy, I just introduced the title of your presentation, which is The Global Role of Meat, A Transnational Perspective, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So I will hand over to you now, if you are ready. 
One second, please. Okay. So do we... Sorry, one, one moment, please. So Baddy needs to share his slides. Does he, can I ask my colleagues down at the back of the room? Apologies for this, if you can just bear with us for a minute. Hello, Frank, do you, need, do you see my slide? Ah, now they are appearing, Baddy, yes. So just you need to move them to presentation mode. I think you're in duplicate screen mode at the moment. Oh. Yes, and just go to full screen now and you will be perfect. No, that's, that's not what we want to oh. see. No, don't do that. So, Baddy, look, just stay with us, please. We have experts working on this issue. I'm not one of them, so, but somebody more competent than me will sort this. And now? Now, yes. So, can you control the presentation, Baddy? Yes, I do. Yep. Can you, do you see it right? We see it now perfectly. So I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frank. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, I'm really delighted to uh, talk to you today and uh, give some uh, feedback or some thought on the role of livestock in general and uh, meat production in particular in global food security and nutrition. As you all know, the livestock sector has been one of the uh, uh, the uh, the sector that we most uh, have seen most growth in the last decades, uh, and this uh, growth is fueled by the uh, population growth, but also by a raising income and organization, but also uh, fueled by improvement in genetics and in, in health, animal health, in herd uh, flock management in housing and in uh, uh, many practices. Uh, the meat sector, uh, for the meat sector, the highest increase is observed for poultry meat with 4.5% and followed by pig meat with 2.3%. This uh, uh, growth is expected to continue in the next decade, driven by mainly by growth in the uh, developing countries. Here you see the terrestrial animal source food availability in national food supplies. And by a terrestrial animal source food, we refer to uh, bovine, meat, mutton, goat, pig, and poultry meat, as well as other meats, but also to egg and milk. Uh, and you see also that the average terrestrial animals food in the world food supply is estimated uh, at uh, 383 grams per capita per day. But you also see a big differences between the regions and within regions. The highest uh, supply is in uh, the United States, followed by Australia, New Zealand and Northern Europe. And the lowest supply is in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, in this figure, you see the importance of uh, animal protein uh, for in food security. And the, the figure shows the correlation between per capita supply of animal protein 
and the Global Hunger Index. And you, as you can see, the uh, countries with the lowest uh, per capita uh, supply of animal protein show the highest uh, hunger index. Likewise, here you have the correlation between meat consumption and stunting as indicator of uh, importance uh, of uh, uh, animal source food for uh, uh, and meat, in particular for animal human nutrition. And again, you see uh, the countries with the uh, lowest uh, annual meat consumption showing the highest stunting rate uh, of children below the age of five. Uh, uh, so the uh, nutrient value of animal source food is well demonstrated. And uh, animal source food and meat in particular have a high quality protein as indicated by the uh, digestible and dispensable amino acid scores, uh, contain many mineral and vitamins, important amino acid, nutrient, and bioactive components that are predominantly uh, found mainly in, in, in animal source food. And on this basis, the uh, FAO members requested FAO to conduct a global assessment on the uh, contribution of livestock to food security, nutrition, and healthy diet. And the first study under this global assessment entitled the contribution of terrestrial animal source food to healthy diet for improved nutrition and healthy diet will be released uh, in two weeks time in, in, uh, here in FAO and we'll be have, we'll having a launch of this publication. And this publication shows that most of scientific evidence uh, is concentrated on the contribution of terrestrial animal source food to uh, nutrition and health of women, especially during pregnancy, children, adolescent, and adult, but also showed important uh, uh, gaps uh, or evidence gaps for some uh, population subgroups, and especially uh, adults, uh, uh, older adults in uh, low and mid income countries. Uh, this figure shows the, uh, uh, the uh, quantity of food needed to cover one third of the requirement of six mi uh, micronutrients uh, in two regions. And uh, as you can see, a small ad addition of meat or offals or milk and eggs in the diet can help improve the nutrition in vulnerable populations. I'm sorry, I'm going too fast, considering the time I'm, I have. Uh, but in addition, uh, uh, besides uh, animal source food, uh, livestock provide important uh, 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 products and services. They provide manure to fertilize the soil. They provide uh, 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 traction and, and uh, draft power and transportation but also they represent an asset for the uh, poor people to dispose of in times of crisis. Uh, they provide employment, uh, they empower, uh, uh, contribute to uh, women empowerment, empowerment. Uh, but also livestock sector and meat uh, sector uh, contribute significantly to national economies. And you can see on the figure on the right that uh, the livestock sector contribute between 25% and 40% in uh, high income countries in, U in, in Europe and, and North America, and between 15 and 25% in other regions. The difference of this contribution is related to the level of demand in these regions of animal source food, but also to the value addition uh, provided to the uh, animal products. But you can see also on the on the curve here on the figures that the growth in the livestock sector is highest in developing countries compared to develop, uh, developed ones. But along with these benefits comes a number of challenges, as you all know, and with about 60 to 70 percent of pathogen affecting a human have animal origin and the burden of zoonosis fall mostly on the poor farmers. With the increase, uh, uh, with the intensification of animal production, 
comes an increased use of uh, antimicrobials, not only to treat the livestock and, uh, uh, and uh, control diseases, but in many cases to promote growth and production. And the use of antimicrobial as growth promoter is leading to uh, increasing uh, animal antimicrobial resistance. Uh, 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 in addition to that, uh, practices to increase short-term profitability of livestock production may degrade animal welfare, affecting the immunity and the productivity of animals, rendering them more susceptible to diseases. You know all that livestock are the largest user of agricultural land, but a large portion of the grassland cannot be cropped. Livestock consume one third of the global cereal production, but this represents only 14% of the global livestock feed ration. And the remaining 86% of the ration is not edible by human. And we all know that the livestock contribute about 14.5% uh, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, with the uh, beef and dairy uh, uh, representing or accounting for two-thirds of this emission. On the other side, livestock contribute to the conservation of biodiversity, provide several eco ecosystem functions, and is a part of the climate solutions. Uh, Low-carbon livestock is possible, and we all know that. And for this, FAO has shown uh, by, uh, that by adopting existing good management practices, like on, uh, related to feed, related to herd management, related to manure management, it is possible to reduce the emission by up to 30%, and this in all regions. For this reason, FAO promotes practices for improving production efficiency, Sequ uh, carbon sequestration and circularity. Uh, ba based on all this, FAO uh, initiated the Sustainable Livestock uh, Transformation Initiatives, which aim to build more sustainable, efficient, inclusive and resilient livestock sector for all. And the first pillar of this initiative, uh, considering all the criticisms of all the bad press on the livestock sector is to provide more to be or build a global balanced narrative on the sustainable livestock. Uh, and considering that livestock contributes uh, for about 40% of agricultural GDP, but receive less than 5% of the investment, uh, uh, the second pillar is to, uh, aims to increase investment in the livestock sector. The third pillar is to strengthen sustainable pathways and framework in the, uh, in the different subsectors of the livestock. And the fourth one, integrate the work on animal production and health al along with the, uh, with the soil health, all this under the umbrella of the One Health. Last but not least, uh, enhance good practices and knowledge sharing. Uh, as you know, that also FAO established this subcommittee uh, on livestock. This is the only governing body in FAO that deals with livestock issues. And uh, the mandate is to discuss and build consensus on livestock issues and priorities and advise FAO and its member on the technical and policy actions needed to optimize the contribution of livestock to, to the sustainable development goals. The uh, first session of the last uh, the subcommittee was held in March 2022, and we are now preparing the second session, which will take place in May 2024. For this year, uh, FAO is organizing the uh, will organize the Global Conference on Sustainable Livestock uh, Transformation. This conference will take place. Uh, uh, between 25 and 27 September 23, 
and uh, we uh, you can visit our website and uh, get more information about the conference and uh, soon we will uh, share with you uh, several communication on this conference uh, in addition to that we will organize the global feed regulations forum uh, in november 2023 and fao is coordinating the global F, uh, the global uh, international year of uh, camelids in 24 and the international year of rangeland and pastoralism in 26 with this thank you for your attention i'm sorry for going so quick in this presentation over to you So thank you very much for that, Batty. I think in a very short time, you managed to get across a lot, lot of information and you really set the scene for us in relation to the, the role and importance of meat um, across the, the globe uh, and, and its various um, functions. So we'll tease through some of that in more detail later. Uh, thank you very much for that, Batty. And um, if you can stay with us for some of the morning, that would be great, but we understand if you have to go to other uh, events. So now. I'm going to introduce our second speaker, um, Frederic, Frederic Leroy, who is president of the Belgium Association of Meat Science and Technology, among many other uh, things he does. So, Frederic, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Frank. Um, so, today I'm here in, in a triple role. I'm, uh, first of all, I'm a uh, let me see if that works. I'm a food scientist at the uh, University of Brussels, and uh, my expertise happens to be in the domain of animal source foods and, and meat in particular. Second, I'm the president, as said, of BAMST, which is the Belgian Association of Meat Science and Technology. Um, BAMST is an academic nonprofit organization, and its mission is to uh, establish a, a network of scientists in the field of meat science and technology, obviously, and to, um, to stimulate scientific research, and especially also its dissemination to a broader public. We try to be a, a point of reference nationally, but also as much as we can internationally. And uh, we are completely self-supporting and do not rely on, on sponsoring. But we do try our best to be impactful nonetheless. So BAMST, just to give you a bit of background where this is coming from as well, BAMST was founded in 1986 after the organization of the, th um, the 32nd European Meeting of Meat Research Workers, and that was in Ghent, which is now known as ICOMST, the International Conference on Meat Science and Technology. Now, since then, BAMST has organized one or more events per year, which included also the 2011 ICOMST meeting in Ghent again, and the 2019 meeting on the role of ruminants in sustainable diets, which was organized with the International Dairy Federation in Brussels, <coughs> and which involved uh, a series of international top speakers, just as today in, in our collaboration with ATF. So the point I want to make is that as a meat scientist and as a BAMST president, it became increasingly obvious over the last, say, seven, eight years that my own academic topic of interest, my own academic expertise became something that is polarizing, leads to emotional and uh, very often also hyperbolic debates, a lot of scientific inaccuracies and disbalance, especially in mass media, as you know, but uh, not only, to the point of becoming potentially harmful to the entire discussion on food systems and uh, human and plant planetary health in particular. Which leads me to my third role today here, and this is uh, the fact that together with, uh, together with six other experts from Switzerland, USA, Australia, and Ireland, we decided to set up a two, uh, people that shared those same concerns, we decided to set up a, a two-day scientific summit, which was held indeed at Chagask in Dublin in October 2022, to have a comprehensive look at the evidence by once more inviting top speakers, experts in their fields, and to address the three main domains that are always cited in this debate, meaning nutrition and health, sustainability, sustainability and environment, and then the societal, ethical aspects and everything that comes with that. So to have a comprehensive look at, at the evidence. Um, this slide here gives you an overview of the various speakers, and three speakers are highlighted in, in uh, in blue, and those are the three speakers we invited today as well from the three respective domains. 
there's a, there's a little link there on the top, uh, and if you go to the Chagask website, you will find most of the videos that were given during that conference and that are now available to, to all. The, um, so as, as a follow-up of this, of the, of, or in the framework of this summit, uh, the Dublin Declaration was launched. And the Dublin Declaration has the intention to give voice, to give a voice of concern, an expression of concern to the many scientists that are working in this domain who um, are on a daily basis trying to do their utter best to improve the, the food system and, and by focusing on, on livestock and animal source foods. Um, who are the actual experts in the field and, who, and very often not participating in some of the high-level discussions. That being said, of course, the same people do perfectly acknowledge that we are facing a double challenge. There is a call on the one hand to increase the availability of livestock foods to meet growing populations and, and rising standards of, of living. But at the same time, this evolution comes also with pressure on biodiversity, on climate change, nutrient flows, and especially also, of course, animal health and welfare. So this is this double challenge that we need to face, and the Dublin Declaration acknowledges this challenge. It's not offering a policy solution, but it's, it's, a, it's a call for, for a more balanced discussion, and it addresses also the three domains I've just cited. Um, if it comes to, to health, I just pick out a couple of short citations just to give you a flavor of what we're trying to say. Um, if it comes to, to, um, to, to diets and, and health, well, we, we know, of course, that well-resourced individuals who have access to supplementation, who has the nutritional knowledge, who have the bodies that allow for such diets can achieve adequate nutrient intakes while heavily restricting animal source foods. However, this is not, approach that, not an approach that we should recommend for general populations, especially not for vulnerable populations, people with elevated needs. When it comes to the environment, um, the declaration makes the point that animals, livestock animals, are irreplaceable for circular systems. You cannot just unplug them from the food system. They are required for a circular flow of materials, biomass, and agriculture. They generate, generate a series of benefits that have to do with ecosystem services, um, biodiversity contributions, provided that, of course, the uh, animal agriculture systems are well performed. And again, recognizing, of course, all the challenges in this domain. And as a third point, it was also addressed by the previous speaker, livestock ownership is extremely important in rural communities. Um, it's a form of capital. It's, uh, it's essential to social tissues. It's an entry point for women to access gender equality. And there's an extremely important societal dimension here that we have to contrast also with the ethical concerns that are raised by some people. And uh, as, as a last uh, citation from the Dublin Declaration, something I want to read out uh, word by word. And this, this paragraph is coming from the Solution Cluster on Sustainable Livestock that was um, written down in, for the occasion of the United Nations Food System Summit of 2021. Livestock is the millennial-long pro proven method to create healthy nutrition and secure livelihoods. It's a wisdom deeply embedded in cultural values everywhere. Sustainable livestock will also provide solutions to stay within the safe operating zone of planet Earth's boundaries, the only Earth we have. This is, the, this is a snapshot from the, from the website of the Dublin Declaration. Uh, we have almost a thousand scientists now that, have, that are endorsing the declaration, that are contributing to this expression of academic and uh, scientific concern. Um, and we, of course, need not just to come up with a declaration as such, we need to also provide the evidence that is behind the declaration to have an absolutely evidence-based uh, discussion. Very soon we will also um, publish a special issue. Um, you see here some, uh, some snapshots on special issue. It will be published on the 18th of April, if I understood well, it could be the 19th. 
So let's say within a week, <coughs> and um, the special issue will publish the papers written by Dublin speakers, but also other co-authors, and will, uh, for the first time, uh, I believe, and as far as my knowledge goes, for the first time we will have very um, comprehensive integration of all the scientific evidence in a language that is scientific and technical, but not all too much. It's written in a way that it's also understandable for uh, laypersons, to a certain degree at least. If all goes well by the end of this session, the people in the room will receive uh, a preprint of the editorial of the special issue. I see somebody nodding, so that seems to be fine. Um, and uh, also the uh, implication sections, which are the summary of each paper. Now, those are not exactly the same as they will appear in the final issue, so take them with some reservation. And please be patient for just a little while. Uh, these are some snapshots again. This is the editorial. Uh, this is a Dublin Declaration, which is also included in the special issue. But just in the interest of time, let me move on to the first speaker today, which is uh, Professor Stanton. Alice Stanton is a clinician scientist. She's a professor in cardiovascular pharmacology at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And she's also director of human health at Definition Nutrition. She served on the committee developing Ireland's Agri-Food Strategy 2030 and as an assembly member for the Horizon Europe Cancer Coalition. She's a member of the Irish Climate and Health Coalition and of the World Action Against Salt, Sugar and Health. Over the last year, she has delivered many lectures, and I certainly can testify to that, concerning evidence-based healthy diets from sustainable food systems, including the impactful lecture at the 2020 Oxford Farming Conference. And Alice will address the, 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 the domain, uh, and of course, mostly from within her expertise, but trying to also give a broader view on the domain of health and nutrition and chronic disease and everything that comes with that. The main questions are, is there something as too little meat or too much meat? Alice, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frederick, uh, for that introduction, and uh, Baddy for the, the global overview. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you this morning uh, talking about human health and nutrition, in particular focusing on what's too much and what's too little of meat. Uh, and I'm also addressing an additional subtitle, uh, which is very much in keeping with the Dublin Summit, of the importance of using transparent, accurate evidence uh, rather than opinions when we're discussing these really important topics. I'm going to start with what is a healthy diet? Well, according to the WHO, and I agree, a healthy diet needs to do two key things. It needs to protect against malnutrition, against nutritional deficiencies, but it also needs to protect against chronic illnesses, the illnesses of excesses, uh, which are very common in many of our societies, the heart attacks, the strokes, the cancers. And we're not doing very well worldwide. Amongst the 8 billion of us, almost 1 billion are chronically undernourished, insufficient calories. These people in the middle panel go to bed hungry. On the other side, twice as many of us are either overweight or obese. And what's less well recognized is are the people in the third panel who suffer from hidden hunger. This is where the diets are adequate calorifically, but quality-wise they're inadequate, lacking in quality protein, key minerals and vitamins, such as iron, selenium, iodine, B12, vitamin D. All of those are either best got or are solely got from animal source foods. 
So we've been eating meat for almost four million years. We did start as herbivores, but about four million years ago, we transferred to the grasslands and realized that there was more nutrition to be got from eating meat, uh, dairy, eggs, and fish. And our digestive tracts have evolved appropriately so that now our digestive tract is more similar to that of a pure carnivore than to a herbivore. So we don't have multiple stomachs. We have a single stomach. We don't have a functional cecum, which ferments food and makes uh, grass-based foods digestible. We have an infunctional cecum. And this is why if the percentage of calories got from animal source foods is reduced too much, so if it goes below 30%, both mineral and vitamin deficiencies become more common. So below 30% of calories coming from animal source foods, increasing uh, prevalence of deficiencies of the vitamins in the left-hand panel and of the minerals in the middle panel. Another way of looking at it is looking at the list of commonly lacking micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals, on the right-hand side uh, panel. The foods that are rich in those commonly lacking micronutrients are listed in order from most rich to least rich. Of the top 20 foods that are enriched for those micronutrients, 18 are animal source foods, are meat, dairy, eggs, etc. That's concerning levels, but let's look at a real endpoint. And Badi also commented on this. Uh, let's look at childhood stunting. And childhood stunting is not just small children. It's children that are suboptimally developed physically, but also their brains are less well developed. Because brain development, particularly in youth, requires quality protein, iron, iodine, vitamin D, vitamin B12. <coughs> so children that are born stunted actually do not develop well. They don't engage in school as well as they should. Lesser academic achievements, lesser career options, lesser ability to provide for their families. And then you get a vicious circle between the generations, which is perpetuated. The pink colored countries in the top left uh, panel uh, are where childhood stunting is greater than 30%. One in three children are stunted. They're the exact same countries where meat intake, where dairy intake, and where seafood intake is least. That's an observational study. The gold standard of proof of an association is a randomized uh, trial. So therefore, let's look at this Kenyan uh, school children study, where researchers from Harvard took 12 national, school, uh, national schools in Kenya, and they randomized three to getting an additional vegetable stew each day that the children turned up for school for almost two years. Three schools got the vegetable stew plus dairy. Three schools got the vegetable stew with additional meat. All of those got an equivalent amount of calories, but very different uh, protein and micronutrient content. The last group of uh, three schools actually got no additional feeding. And they looked at their academic achievement over the five semesters. They looked at arithmetic, English, two national languages, 
uh, geography, the sciences, and the arts. And in the far right, you can see that the average scores summing up all of those subjects. Those that got meat in addition to the vegetable stew had on average 17% higher scores. That's a huge difference across um, for, for schools to actually achieve that difference uh, for all children. And it's not just infants and children that benefit from meat and animal source foods. The more meat, the more animal source foods that you eat, the longer you live. These are two 2022 publications. But, as has been pointed out, we have a climate crisis uh, facing us. And that will not be good for human health. So I'm a physician, and I certainly do not want climate chaos to occur. The heat and extreme events, uh, weather events, droughts and desertification endangering food security, uh, increased poverty, inequalities and migration uh, will have hugely damaging effects on human health. So I, like many others, welcomed the start of the conversation uh, between balancing human dietary needs and planetary boundaries that was initiated by the Eat Lancet uh, reference diet published in the Lancet in 2019. Now this recommended a doubling of intake of fruit, vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds. And I actually agree with that. We're not eating enough fruit and vegetables. We know that. It recommended a halving of meat and dairy intakes. So by comparison with generally accepted national guidelines where at least 25% of the diet comes from animal source foods, about an eighth from meat and about uh, meat and fish and about another eighth from uh, dairy. They moved over to less than an eighth in total for animal source foods with the Eat Lancet reference diet. And they said that that would save 11 million deaths each year globally. But that was going to come from the increase in fruit and vegetables, the reduction in salt and calories that were entailed by the Eat Lancet reference diet. It wasn't going to come from the reduced meat and dairy intakes. There was no accounting of the nutritional deficiency debts and illnesses that would occur with halving of meat and dairy. And they didn't consider what kind of meat and dairy alternatives were going to be eaten. Because the currently available plant-based meat and dairy alternatives are ultra-processed foods, hugely rich in calories, sugar, salt, and trans fats, which are hugely damaging to human health. So the Beyond Meat burger has the same protein content as steak, but five times the salt, causing high blood pressure, causing strokes, and heart attacks. The jackfruit and mushroom products are even worse approximately 20% of the protein, even more sugar and salt. Almond milk, twice the salt, one-eighth the protein. And yes, the cultured meats and precision-fermented animal-free dairy products are also ultra-processed foods. So many people criticised the, uh, the Eat Lancet reference diet concerning the nutritional deficiencies. But it was really welcome when just last month uh, this was published. And it comes from Tyg Beale and Jessica Fanzo. Professor Jessica Fanzo is really important because she's one of the authors of the Eat Lancet reference diet and is on the commission, the second commission for Eat Lancet, which will soon be publishing their findings and their 
revised uh, recommendations for balance. This paper, published in Lancet Planet Health, acknowledged that the Eat Lancet reference diet will result in micronutrient deficiencies. And therefore, they have recommended a very different diet, which increases the percentage of animal source foods from 12% to 26%. So back to at least a quarter of calories being delivered from uh, animal source foods as a minimum for adequacy. We still have the issue that many publications in the medical and scientific literature have said that animal source foods are causing deaths from chronic disease, from heart attacks, from strokes, from cancers. <coughs> so this publication here said that each single serving of Frankfurter sandwich results in 35 minutes of life lost. So how many have of Frankfurters? I haven't eaten many actually, but how many have you eaten in your life? How many 35 minutes have you lost? This uh, publication estimated that if you cut out red and processed meats, you'd add 1.6 years to a young woman's lifespan and 1.9 uh, years to a man's. I'm not going to go through all the publications, but I'm going to focus on the Global Burden of Disease publication of 2019. And the reason is because most of the other publications either directly use global burden of disease data or they use the logic and the similar uh, analytical techniques. Also, the global burden of disease publications are the most influential on policymakers. So they're used by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations the World Health Organization, and the European Commission. And they know their, the importance of their publications. <coughs> so they recently, uh, led by uh, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, University of Washington, they recently self-described themselves as the de facto source for global health accounting. This is a busy slide. It shows the 2017 analysis versus the 2019 analysis for the relationship between dietary risks and deaths. You can see the big excesses are high body, uh, body mass index or diets that are high in calories and diets that are high in salt. Uh, the big deficiencies are child and maternal malnutrition and then diets that are low in whole grains in fruits, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and omega-3 fats. They did acknowledge that diets low in milk actually causes deaths in both the 2017 and the 2019 analysis. But that's an underestimate because they only counted the protection that dairy affords against colorectal cancer. They didn't include that actually dairy more, two or more full-fat dairy servings actually have been shown to protect against overweight and obesity, protect against heart attacks and strokes, and a 25% reduction in total mortality. I'm going to focus on diets high in red meat for the rest of the talk. Uh, in 2017, Deaths attributed to excessive red meat consumption were estimated as 25,000 per year, which is tiny by comparison with the diets excessive in calories causing 4.5 million deaths. The 2019 analysis increased the number of deaths attributed to red meat. Oh. Yeah. Increased the number of deaths attributed to red meat consumption up to almost 900,000, a 36-fold increase 
without providing the evidence. Now, they said that they did their own systematic reviews and they came up with sufficient evidence supporting a causal relationship between red meat intake with six adverse outcomes. So with ischemic heart disease, with two types of stroke, okay, apologies, uh, with two types of stroke, uh, with breast cancer, with colorectal cancer, and with type two diabetes mellitus. And you can see that actually these relationships all started from zero and were all statistically significant, as indicated by the standard error bars, which don't include uh, one. They said that actually they came up with more empirical methods for deciding what was the optimal intake of red meat, termed the theoretical minimum risk exposure level. And they said that that actually should change from 22.5 grams per day on average out of the 2017 estimates to zero. So from the first mouthful, red meat was causing deaths. They added up all the deaths uh, due to heart attacks, strokes, and cancers, and they said this is the relationship between red meat and relative risk of death, that it starts at zero and actually is statistically significant at five or ten grams per day. So every mouthful is causing problems. Across an intake up to 80 grams per day, which is what the vast majority in the world are eating. So a huge majority of the world are consuming less than 75 grams per day. Many, much more, much less than that. So that's the relevant range to look at effects of unprocessed red meat. When we looked at the scientific evidence, we actually could not see that relationship. So you can see here studies from the whole world, the pure study, Asian studies, European studies, and North American studies. Not a single study showed an increased risk of red meat at less than 25 grams per day. And in fact, the global study, the European studies, and the Asian studies did not show an increased risk until you reached 75 grams per day. Two of the American studies did show increased risk, small increase in risk, between 25 and 75 grams per day. Because of that disparity between the scientific evidence that we could find in the literature, six of us wrote a letter to The Lancet concerning the Global Burden of Disease 2019 analysis. Uh, from six different universities, from Ireland, from the UK, from Belgium, and from Australia. And we asked two key questions. Where's the evidence? What will happen to deficiency debts if we consider that the optimal intake of red meat is zero. It took us nine months to get our letter published. We faced many obstacles. We did receive an answer from the Global Burden Disease Collaborators a month after publication of our letter, and they did admit errors in the 2019 analysis. They didn't answer our two key questions, and despite admitting errors, all they said was, we will do better in future global burden disease analysis. That's not good enough. The two committees that control medical and scientific publication are very clear. When errors are confirmed, they must be corrected or the paper must be retracted. Global burden disease 2019 risk factors analysis has not been retracted to date. We were delighted when we were joined uh, from members of the Academy of Nutritional Sciences and the World Cancer Research Fund. Again, they asked for the evidence. They said what is currently published is implausible 
and they never said that red meat eating should be zero. We got a lot of media and scientific interest, and I'm just going to highlight one on the right-hand side. Uh, on social media, Professor Gordon Guyatt from McMaster University is one of the founders of evidence-based medicine because we do not practice medicine based on opinion or theories. We practice it based on evidence. What he said was, calls for evidence remain unanswered even in the latest author's response, big problem. It is indeed a big problem. We were delighted when in October of last year, in fact, Global Burden of Disease collaborators did publish a series of papers in Nature Medicine, including this one concerning the relationship between consumption of unprocessed red meat and human health. And the conclusions are very different. Now they're saying for those six outcomes, only the relationship with colorectal cancer is statistically significant. And even that's questionable, to be honest. However, they have concluded no or very weak evidence that unprocessed red meat is associated with any increased risk. The evidence is insufficient to make any strong or conclusive recommendations. And optimal intake of red meat is very uncertain and could be as high as 200 grams per day. Now, I'm not recommending that there isn't enough red meat in the world and we couldn't produce it sustainably. But that's what the evidence is there, is there. There are uh, consequences to non-correction of errors and non-retraction of papers. So Global Burden of Disease 2019 Risk Factors Study has been cited by over 2,000 papers in the two years since it was published, including this very influential publication in The Lancet called The Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. Using Global Burden of Disease 2019 data and the Eat Lancet reference diet, which has now been shown to be inadequate, they are saying that two million deaths are related to red and processed meat and dairy consumption. They're now saying dairy consumption is causing deaths rather than the reverse. Incomprehensible. Also used in 40 policy papers, including the National Food Strategy for England. This plot shown in the evidence document uh, indicates that diets high in red meat and in processed meat are causing four times as many illnesses as diets high in salt. This is just not true. I am concerned that policy documents in the EU, such as Farm to Fork and Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, used Global Burden Disease 2017 data. What if they use 2019 data which has not been retracted in the outworkings of these policy documents? My final slide. So what are the key messages? Scientists, policymakers, and all involved in the food system should be extremely wary of global health estimates that are not rigorously and transparently evidence-based and or that ignore the protections afforded against nutritional deficiencies and chronic disease afforded by animal source foods. The relationship between red meat intake and disease burden is either U-shaped or reverse J-shaped. Too much may well be associated with very small increases in colon cancer it may also be due to eating in excess of lots of things and other lifestyle factors. 
but deficiencies or eating too little red meat is much more strongly associated with large increases in deficiency disease burdens, iron deficiency anemia, childhood stunting, fragility in the elderly, particularly amongst those uh, people with increased needs. The majority of the world's population are not eating enough dairy nor omega-3 enriched foods, and I didn't have a chance to discuss that. Consumption of nutrient-rich animal source foods in appropriate evidence-based quantities should continue to be included in national and international guidelines for healthy, balanced diets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, so next up is the sustainability discussion, where uh, the speaker of today, uh, Willem Windisch, is an, an agricultural scientist and full professor of animal nutrition at the Technical University of Munich since 2010. And before that, he held a similar position at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. He studies nutritional properties of feed materials and principles of biomass transformation in the metabolism of livestock with particular interest in minerals, functional dietary components, and the impact of livestock feeding on food quality, food safety, and the environment. Thank Frederick, thanks for a kind introduction. Okay, here's the technique. Okay, meat in sustainable food systems and circularity and uh, uh, context in ecological context and metrics. I'm very happy to uh, give a, a little talk on this. Time is short, so I directly go into the, into the topic. You know, uh, animal production is faced with uh, a lot of criticisms. Animals eat um, human food in a world where in other places humans starve. They pollute the environment. And a climate killer cow, for example, is a very strong narrative on this. And anyhow, it's a, uh, it's a method of, of stone age. It's a stone age to to kill animals and to eat them. Yeah? So this is the, the opinion, public opinion we have. Okay, um, but when we go back to a discussion, we have to uh, we have to accept some things, some uh, some aspects around, and we should look to it in a scientific into in a in a scientific way. And the first uh, the first thing we have to accept is as other speakers already said, is that the resources of feeding humans in future will become very, very scarce. Globally available area of land becomes scarce, scarce in future, and this is, a, this is the conclusion out of it, food competition between livestock and humans must terminate. Yeah? So you know all the figures, you know the figures of the uh, global population, <laughs> In 1970, we were uh, 4 billion people. Now we are 8 billion people. And in the next generation, which is well, well, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years ahead of us, uh, we will uh, exceed 10 uh, billion people. But the arable land, the land where we produce our, our biomass, our food, it will stay the same or it will even will uh, be, become less. And uh, in, order to, in order to illustrate this, I, I think everybody of every one of you knows a soccer field, yeah, a soccer field of Arab land. Uh, in 1970, it, uh, it it had to to feed two and a half people. Now they are four people, and in the future, in the next generation, human generation, it is at least uh, five, uh, six and a half, maybe seven people to be fed on this on this limited area, and we don't know. Maybe uh, the scarcity becomes even more because we have climate change, and the climate change takes away arable land by desertification, by erosion, and so on. Um, so, uh, 
it's, the current situation is, and we have heard it in the in the first uh, in the first uh, lecture today, that around one third of global harvest of corn and of wheat and of cereals is fed to animals, and this is a conflict of interest. Very clearly, this is a conflict of interest, and in future, it is very clear that uh, I'm really sad to say this. As, an, as, an, as a livestock scientist, I love animals, I love livestock, but production of plant-based food will become the first thing to do on the arable land in future. And we have to terminate, we have to terminate um, a food competition. So the question arises, do we have to terminate meat production as well, as a consequence? So this is this is uh, said and this is published in newspapers. You can see it everywhere. So this is the question now. Is it a co as a consequence of the change in the uh, scarcity in, in, in resources to produce human food? Can we afford uh, livestock? Can we afford meat production in future? Uh, statement number two. It comes directly to the question of f uh, food competition. We have to a knowledge that agriculture is not producing food. It does not produce food, it produces biomass. Plants are biomass and not food. We just make food out of this uh, biomass. And most of this biomass agriculture is producing is non-edible. Look to these pictures. What can you eat from these pictures? How much can you eat from this biomass? So let's look into arable land. Yeah? Arable land produces a lot of non-edible biomass just um, by, by three reasons. It's crop rotation, it's crop rotation, uh, so-called co-products and so-called byproducts. Crop rotation is very often underestimated in this context. Crop rotation means uh, change in, in, in cultures from year to year in order to to maintain fertility in order to maintain the ecologic ecology of the soil. And this includes, particularly in, 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 uh, in, in, in organic agriculture, it includes also non-edible cultures. In, in uh, organic uh, production, for example, you have to sacrifice up to one-third, one-third of, uh, of your arable land to collect nitrogen and to maintain the... Uh, uh, the, the, um, to maintain uh, the productivity of the land to produce vegan food. So this is a huge amount of non-edible biomass at the expense of, uh, of human food. So this produces a lot of, uh, uh, of non-edible biomass. But also, uh, also <coughs> the co-products, the uh, food-producing cultures, they have other material, other than kernels or beets, yeah? they have straw, they have hum, uh, they have leaves and so on. And most of the, uh, the food-producing cultures, they produce more non-edible food than edible uh, uh, biomass. And the most efficient one is wheat and corn. And even those uh, cultures, they have biomass, non-edible biomass in the ratio of one to one. And if you put uh, yeah, this is, so this is uh, arable land. But we have also a huge part of, uh, of uh, agricultural area which you cannot turn into arable land. This is the so-called um, absolute grassland. Absolute grasslands are areas where, which are too steep, too wet, too dry, too far away, is flooding zones. Uh, you simply cannot turn into arable land. And if it would have been possible, the farmers would have done since hundreds of years. Yeah? So you cannot. And in Europe, for example, in Central Europe, Germany, it's uh, the, average, uh, the average of this, this grassland, this absolute grassland is 30%. And on the, on the global scale, it is at least 70% of the arable land is such a grassland. You cannot use as uh, for growing, uh, for growing feed producing, feed producing cultures. So one could say, for example, but using grassland uh, 
it's not natural because usually they would uh, grow forest on it. So it is sub something artificial. And I would like to uh, show you this picture uh, and this aspect in order to say this is not true. Is it true? Is it really true that uh, on grasslands there would grow forest? No. This is wildlife. I, excuse me, I go back. Huh? This, is, um, this is wildlife, what you can see. This is African wildlife. And Pablo Manzano, he has shown uh, very, very clearly. He's, uh, uh, he g gave me these pictures. The, uh, this picture. You see that there is uh, open grassland. And who is doing the open grassland? Who is opening, who is keeping the, the landscape open? These are the wild animals, the large herds of herbivores. They go through this, uh, this area and they drive the forest back. The forest is in uh, uh, steep places, in mountains, but not in the, in the areas where large herds can pass. So they open, they open the space and they, uh, they produce open grasslands and a mosaic between grassland and some islands of, of, of forests. So this is na nature. And we would have this uh, as well here in Europe, in Central Europe, in, in Europe, we would have this as well if we would still have elephants, mammoths, uh, bisons, and uh, 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 wild um, cattle. But we ex extinguished these animals already during Stone Age. So the argument that there is forest growing, it is because we change nature. We extinguish the so-called megafauna. And there's many examples uh, to, to, where you can see uh, what animal, what herds of animals are doing with landscapes. On the left, on the right picture, you see this is uh, anywhere in Germany, central Germany, an, an, um, a mountain area uh, where uh, the abandoned land, it was since uh, decades, no agriculture anymore, and the forest came back. And just by sending sheep, just by sending sheep into this area, it turns into an open grassland by itself. And as you can see, this is full of biodiversity. Yeah, so it is an absolute natural situation. So grazing livestock may create open spaces with high biodiversity. And um, uh, of course, we cannot do this in Europe anymore because we have streets, we have roads, we have fences, yeah? but agriculture and livestock can replace these lost habitats. Okay, this was an excursion to, uh, to grassland, but let's go back to the non-edible biomass. Uh, here, uh, some quantitative figures, so how, how, what is the distribution of, 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 of uh, non-edible biomass? This is an example, I took it from Germany. In Germany, the, the German agriculture collects 120 million tons, metric tons of, uh, of, of, uh, of biomass, of dry matter per year. And as you can see, uh, a, a huge quantity, where's the laser pointer here? Oh no, it doesn't work. Huge quantity is grassland, grassland uh, uh, co-products. And you see on the right, uh, on the right you see the harvested products. Harvested products are only one third of this biomass, only one third. So the dominating part of, <clears throat> of biomass is already non-edible. And within the harvested material, one third is uh, byproducts of the, of the industry. So when you buy a bread, a kilogram of bread, you produced a pound of, uh, of bran. When you buy one kilogram of, of, uh, of, of uh, rapeseed oil, you produce two kilograms of rapeseed extracts. And even if we assume that none of the harvested material is fed to, to livestock, it's completely channeled to, uh, to, to vegan food production, then only 20% of the biomass is reaching uh, the human. So 80% is non-edible at least. So taking together, of course, it depends on the area where you're living, how intensive, how much grasslands you have, and so on. So on, on, on average, we can say one kilogram of food, of vegan food bought in the shop, has inevitably entailed three to five kilograms of non-edible biomass. 
And this is something people uh, often do not know. Statement number three, what to do with this biomass? Livestock can double the harvest of food from a given area of arable land by making use of this non-edible biomass. We have to return, we have to make use of this non-edible biomass, this three to five kilogram per kilogram of vegan food. Because there are so, there are so many plant nutrients bound in this. Uh, for example, the, the bran, in the, the bran contains 75%, three quarters of all the phosphorus which has been detracted from the field with the harvest of wheat. And where's the nitrogen and the phosphorus you take away from the field with the harvest of, let's say, rapeseeds? It's 100% in the, in the rapeseed extracts. We have to bring it back. So we have to circulate this material. And there are three strategies. We can bring it back to the soil, directly rotting. This would be some kind of vegan agriculture. Huh? But then you have to bring back all the bran, you have to bring back all uh, the residues from the feed industry, from the food, sorry, from the food, food industry to the area. No one is doing it, but you, sh you, should, you should do it then. Huh? But unfortunately, this is inefficient because rotting occurs at any time. And not at that time and in the next year, the, ne the next plant culture, the winter wheat, for example, requires the nitrogen. So the, f the efficiency as fertilizer is very low, and therefore also the harvest, the vegan, the plant harvest in the next year is low. What we need is a fertilizer you can store and which you can apply targeted. Yeah? And this is, there are only two possibilities to do this, either biogas, we put all this uh, non-edible biomass in the biogas and then we use the residues. We can store this and it has been shown very clearly, very often, that it, it, it doubles the efficiency, doubles the harvest of, uh, of uh, vegan food from a given area by this management, this fertilizer management. Or another strategy would it be feeding to livestock and using the, the dung. And it is, has the same efficiency, it has the same efficiency as um, uh, as using the residues of the biogas plants. So it doubles the harvest. It is more efficient. It is simply uh, management of fertilizer. And at the same time, it generates additional food. So this is the only way to have a win-win situation. How much is this win-win situation? So let's take one kilogram of vegan food. Let's take one kilogram of bread. has around about 100 grams of protein. Very roughly, yeah, 3,000 uh, kilocalories, and uh, uh, this uh, you, we already have with one kilogram. And using this three to five kilogram of non-edible biomass feeding to, to uh, the animal production system, then it generates three kilogram of milk or half kilogram of meat. Uh, everything included, uh, uh, this calculation is, uh, considers already that you have to feed the entire herd, not only the producing animals. So all the animals around, so in total, so the net outcome is around three kilograms of milk and half uh, and a pound of meat. And this adds another hundred grams of protein. So it doubles the earnings, the harvest of protein from the same area without any food competition. So this is huge from the same food, from the same area, from the same limited area, and we have to make use of limited areas of land. This is the task we have to do in future. Number four, circularity highlights the relevance of ruminants to make use of this non-edible biomass. Simple question, how much how much protein can you produce with one kilogram of feed? One kilogram of feed dry matter. Uh, this is on the x-axis. You can produce with chicken meat, you can produce 80 grams pure protein on the plate of the consumer. This equals to around 300, 350 grams of, 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 of meat, including water and all these things. Uh, yeah? Okay, so it's a large pro uh, proportion. So chicken are very, very, chicken are very effective they, uh, they are very uh, efficient. They have, therefore, also they have very low, comparably low footprints. So we should say, 
in future, if we eat uh, animal-derived produce, we should go to chicken. We should go chicken. Yeah? On the other side, beef, for example, is very, very low. Factor 10, only a tenth of protein you can produce. And then, of course, then you have also higher emissions, less efficient. And this figure would tell you, stop immediately with ruminant production. But what is chicken eating? We have seen in the first slide that chicken meat is going up dramatically, it's steadily rising. Why? Why is it? Because it consumes human food. It is that species with, which consumes the most valuable, the most concentrated energy, protein concentrated, most valuable feedstuffs, and these feedstuffs are potential human food. So all our ideas about efficiency and, and uh, eff efficiency and footprints are based on food competition. And this is something we have to stop in future. We cannot afford food competition anymore. So the, the way how, how we have to look to animal production will change. It will change. It will change because ruminants are the only species which can make use most efficiently of this non-edible biomass. So ruminants will keep on going. They have to uh, keep on going. Pig nutrition will face a problem in future because the, uh, the, the amount of feedstuffs, high quality feedstuffs is less, so the productivity will go down, and the loser in this game will be chicken. If we really, if we really uh, intend to minimize food competition, the chicken would have a problem because the amount of high quality, chicken needs high quality food, the amounts of high quality food will be very, very scarce. But unfortunately, we have a, a, a problem in this discussion with the ruminants. Ruminants produce methane. So these kind of species, which could make use, best use of the non-edible biomass, which should maintain, stay, stay in this way, uh, we, uh, we have it right now, they produce methane. What about methane? What about methane here, here in Belgium? Uh, methane in Germany? in Austria, Switzerland. Didn't we have uh, completed our homeworks already? <coughs> Just looking to the numbers, you see the numbers of ruminants. This is Ger Germany uh, since uh, year 1800, since 1800. The numbers of, cattle, uh, numbers of cattle and the numbers of sheep. And you see that it is uh, um, now, it is much lower than in pre-industrial times. It is already below the level of pre-industrial times. And it has been shown last year by a very good publication of, of Kula, uh, is our German experts in, in methane. He has, shown, he has shown that also the methane emissions are below, uh, well below the, uh, the, the level of, uh, uh, of the pre-industrial level. So, okay, we could lean back and say, okay, we have done our homeworks. No, okay, of course it's not good to do this. In, in, a, in a time where we are facing um, uh, uh, climate change. Agriculture can do further reductions in methane, but these reductions should, should be respected as, uh, as a benefit, as a benefit agriculture is serving to the society and not as a homework. This is a real benefit. This is something good we can do, and we should do this. We should do, it, do this. So, how, uh, how effective is it? Uh, for this uh, question, we, we, we should look a little bit into the metrics, into, the, into the, the, the impact of methane. On the left side, you see a figure. This has been done uh, by uh, colleagues from Austria. They, uh, they accumulate, they, they present here, they present the impact of uh, the greenhouse gases uh, on the warming, on, on, uh, on, uh, on heating of, of, of the atmosphere. And it is the radiative forcing. It's not the CO2 equivalence. It's the radiative forcing, so the physical activity. And you see that most of uh, increase in, in, uh, in heating uh, comes from CO2. And that methane, methane is, just, methane is just a small band. A small band. small band becomes a little bit thicker and then becomes a little bit thinner. This is methane. Why is it so? Um, the reason is CO2 is a weak greenhouse gas but it stays long, long time. From our perspectives in planning, it is infinity. 
It is interesting. So every CO2 emission added to the atmosphere by taking out fossil sources, burning, will accumulate, 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 accumulate. And even if it has a low, uh, has a low impact on, on warming by itself, the quantity overrules everything. And this is what we see here. Methane is a strong greenhouse gas, but it has a very short lifetime. Only eight years, and it has a, uh, it, it, the decay is, uh, uh, is following an exponential function. So accepting exponential function, half lifetime of eight years, so it's very simple, so it's mathematics of uh, class, 10th class in the school. So it's simple mathematics that, uh, that it comes at constant amounts of, uh, of, of ruminant production, it comes very quickly to a steady state. So emission comes into a steady state with degradation. And the degradation and this level of, of, of equilibrium, the concentration of equilibrium is very low. And this is what we see here. Yeah? In the time where the animals, where the numbers became a bit more, then the band of methane becomes a little bit thick and then it goes down. So if we now, if we would, if we would kill now, at this today, kill all ruminants, the impact of climate would be almost zero. But if we would increase if we would increase the number of ruminants, it would be dramatically <coughs> heat up the climate. So any change in the emission, the change in the emission is different to be looked to. So if we increase the emission rates, we have a strong impact on climate. If we reduce the emission rate from a given equilibrium, we have almost no impact. And that's... Uh, the mistake, and that's the problem uh, we are facing when we are talking with CO2 equivalent. CO2 equivalent simply ignore the physics uh, uh, of, of uh, atmos atmospheric methane largely. So they overestimate dramatically, they overestimate the current impact of uh, ruminants, and they underestimate heavily what would happen if we increase. Huh? So if we have uh, if we would say we stabilize, uh, we stabilize the, the number of ruminants at the level of circularity, then we could say we have a low level, a low e equilibrium level, and it would have almost no impact on climate. So circularity is number six. Circularity on base of livestock would then minimize the impact of total, total food production. Uh, on environment. Going back to this non-edible biomass, the non-edible biomass is circulating. You cannot avoid that it is circulating. It will circulate, yeah? Either by rotting, by, by bio, biogas, or by, by feeding to, 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 to livestock, it will circulate. So also the emissions are largely independent of this pathway of circulation. So if you, um, if we would uh, abstinence, abstinence from feeding, abstinence from feeding non-edible biomass, it would not relieve the climate, because the emissions, the emissions that have, were already, the emissions were already, most of the emissions were already done during the production on the field when you produce the vegan food. So most of emissions are already done. Methane would play only a negligible role. Huh? So it would not relieve the environment if we would not feed this material to, to, uh, to livestock. We would destroy a lot of food and vegan food production would, have, uh, would, would be forced to intensify, to intensify plant production. You need more fertilizer, you need more energy, you need more machines, you need more land. And this increases the impact on climate uh, from, uh, to produce the food from a given from a Griffin area of land. You can see this quite impressively. There are many, there are many publications on this. Only one, I choose only one. On the x-axis, the consumption of, uh, of, of, uh, of animal-derived food. Yeah? And on the, the right point, this is where we are right now. Intensive animal production, uh, high re consumption of resources, high impact. And if we go back, yeah, if we go back to a more circularity, it goes down, and if we go back to vegan food, it goes up again. So it's this curve. It's not a line back to zero. It is uh, a quadratic curve with a minimum, 
And the minimum, the minimum is simply circularity. So we can state at the moment we are not in this minimum. We are not at circularity. We are not in the minimum. Vegan agriculture would uh, be also out of minimum too. The only way to do this is um, circularity would be, um, uh, would be uh, circularity, and then we have the minimum impact of total food production from a given land. Total food production, vegan plus animal, in total. And this is now very short, a very short statement. It, it is directly consequence out of it. Footprints of milk, meat, and eggs it exhibit two levels. A low level at circularity, a high level above circularity. Yeah? So as long as we stay in circularity, we, 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 we have no food competition. We do not grow feed, animal uh, feed on arable land. We have no land use change. But as soon as we go out of it in order to, to meet the, 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 uh, the, uh, the wishes of the consumer for high amounts of meat, then we have to grow feed on arable land, we have to, do, uh, uh, we have to um, make land use change. And this uh, uh, makes the footprints to increase. So most publications, also, also the publications we have, uh, which were cited today, they do a mistake. They take only one figure, one footprint, common footprint for, let's say, one kilogram of milk. And then they extrapolate to zero. And that's not true. We have at least two steps. Huh? And circularity within circularity is another kind of, of metrics than outside of circularity. So let's take it together. One to seven, food competition must terminate. So this is something we have to acknowledge in future. Livestock in balance with circularity of non-edible biomass, biomass minimizes footprints of overall food production, but unfortunately, it limits also the quantity of produced milk, meat, and eggs. Yeah? So we have less, we have less uh, quantity of feed, less quality of feed, of course, we have less emissions, we have also less animals, but we have considerably less products, particularly swine and pork and, 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 and chicken products. So this concept of circularity, it is nothing new. It is a very old concept. It is also a modern concept in our modern times. It's nothing else but uh, what we are doing with, uh, with energy. We have to, uh, we have to uh, stop with fossil energy sources. We have to uh, accept um, renewable energy sources. And the, the renewable energy sources, this is the limit. They gave us the quantity, gives us the limit of production of our, our total economical and social life. And the same would be uh, in, with circularity. The non-edible biomass is the limiting factor. And within that limiting factor, you have, should produce as good as possible. So what would be the consequence? The consequence would be to maximize the feed efficiency, the feed efficiency of non-edible biomass. We didn't do this before. The feed efficiency of non-edible biomass has to be improved. It is like, it is like uh, in, 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 in energy. So take out the all bulbs of the, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, 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 making light in your rooms and replace it with energy-saving modern things. And this we have to do in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in livestock production as well. Yeah? And a third statement, this is also important, Th third statement, of course it is the result of this would be less animals and less milk, meat, eggs. And this would be a result and it would be not uh, the cause of, uh, the cause of uh, being sustainable. Many politicians, they try to reduce the animal number and they try to reduce consumption of milk, meat, eggs because it is unhealthy or whatever reason. Uh, but this is, this is, uh, this is um, changing cause and effect. The cause should be agriculture. Agriculture needs to become sustainable, and the 
outcome of it would be then less animals and unfortunately also less animal derived products. So, summary, there is no sustainable agriculture without livestock. We need livestock to make it sustainable. And as long as we stay in circularity, meat, meat directly as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a food, and meat as a representative of all other animal-derived products. Meat production in balance with circularity supports environment and climate. Thank you. Thanks to, to both speakers, especially also for keeping well in time. Very much appreciate it. Uh, so I'm sure this material can give rise to agitated discussions <laughs> during the coffee break. Uh, we'll have a, a break now until uh, 11 o'clock, and then, then we start again for the next session. We didn't uh, introduce any Q&A sessions. We'll have that at the end of the, of the event. Thank you.